Welcome back to Echo Ridge. Today, we're going to learn how to play Civilization VI. During my last Civilization playthrough, I had a lot of comments saying, I'm really enjoying this, but I don't 100% understand what's going on. And taking a look from 10,000 feet, I can see why if you've never played a Civilization game, a lot of what's on the screen right now would look sort of daunting. Hence the reason this guide for absolute beginners. The intended audience for this video is someone who hasn't played any Civilization or hasn't played in a very long time. Additionally, this guide's purpose is to give you the sort of meat and potatoes so that you can continue to learn not only through your own gameplay, but through additional strategy videos and Let's Plays. And I say all that because this game is deep. There are so many permutations of units, buildings, cities, districts, leaders, etc, etc, that I could come out with a hundred tutorial videos on Civilization VI and they would still be more content to cover. Civilization is like chess. You never really stop learning about it. As an example, the question mark button up here is the infamous Civlopedia. The game itself comes with an authoritative encyclopedia sitting there at your fingertips. And I highly recommend you get really comfortable within the Civlopedia. Because again, this video is going to teach you the basics, but even expert and professional level Civ players still refer back to the Civlopedia time and time again. As an example of how deep this game goes, every single civilization plays a little bit differently. And notice there's a lot of civilizations. The same goes for the leaders. And there is a lot of leaders. In fact, if you include some of the alternate personalities, for instance, Cleopatra has an Egyptian Cleopatra and a Ptolemaic, there are over 70 leaders. There's also dozens of districts that all have their own specific rules and thus strategies to go along with them. Not to mention each district has several buildings that can go within it. The amount of units in the game. The list just keeps going on and on. And that's why I say you never really stop learning civilization. Hence the reason why the Civilopedia comes in awfully handy. So hopefully I didn't scare too many of you away and you're excited about the lifelong journey that you are about to embark on with civilization. So without further ado, let's get into it. I've rolled up a pretty generic game here and the only mods I have activated are the official DLC packs to unlock more leaders and more civilizations and two UI mods, one of them being Hillier Hills, which makes the game's hills a little bit more pronounced and easier to see, which is helpful for me and I think it's also helpful for you, the viewer, and the tactical camera mod. This allows me to play with the camera a little bit more in an attempt to make the video a little bit more interesting such as being able to zoom all the way into this warrior unit and checking out the gorgeous models. For this guide, I chose America and Teddy Roosevelt, the bull moose Teddy Roosevelt, because America and Teddy's abilities are fairly cut and dry, so for the purposes of the guide, I thought they were an excellent choice. More into Teddy and America's abilities in a little bit. I think our first step in learning civilization is being able to unpack this UI. So we're going to take a few minutes and go over it. Here in the top left, we see a few different resources. These are civilization-wide resources. And as the tooltip says, this is your civilization science per turn, culture per turn, faith per turn, gold, and diplomatic favor. This last one is envoys. We'll get into those in a little bit. As a side note, almost everything in the game has a tooltip. You hold your mouse over it for long enough and it's gonna tell you what it is. In the options, if we go down to interface, you can adjust how delayed that tooltip is. Right below all of our civilization's resources are our civilization management screens. For instance, the tech tree shows us all of our scientific techs. Next to it is the civics tree, and this is an important distinction already. There are two researchable trees in Civilization VI. One requires science, the other requires culture. And this is something that throws off experienced civilization players when they first get into Civilization VI because they're used to only having one tech tree to worry about. And now they have two. The next button is your great people screen, which shows us our progress in earning great people. 
Remember in the beginning I talked about how civilization was such a deep game? These great people make it even deeper because each one will give you an opportunity to enhance or change your strategy within the game. A way to think about great people is those sort of historical figures that changed history in some sort of way. We'll get into more of how you unlock and progress through great people here in a little while. The next button here is World Climate, which shows the current condition of the world. All of this really starts impacting in the mid to late games, but it's important for you to check it out, and that way you're familiar with the screen and you understand its repercussions. With that being said, I am playing with the Rise and Fall and Gathering Storms expansions, but a large amount of this guide will be useful to you even if you don't own those expansions. But I do highly recommend them, so the next time you see them on sale, go ahead and pick them up, because they really do add to the Civilization experience. The next button is Governors, that we're able to earn and then place into cities. And each one of these Governors are also promotable, and they'll give us additional abilities that we have to consider in the strategy of the game. More on them later. And then finally, there's a historical timeline. Since we haven't even taken a turn, we don't have any yet, but this is where we go to see it. Over on the right side, it shows the current turn and the year, and also the leaders that we've met and ourselves and their HUD ribbon. Now this ribbon is an option in the interface tab. You can turn it off, you can show it on mouse over, or always show it. And you'll be able to see why this is useful to look at once we start meeting more civilizations. We also have the current world rankings, which shows all of the victory conditions and who's where. Notice we have a lot of question marks because again, we haven't met anyone. Next to that, we have an era progress. We'll talk about that here in a minute. And then a lot of different reports that are available to you if you wanna take a deeper dive into your civilization situation. Now the bottom right, when we select a unit, we can see that we have a unit pane. We have the end of turn button. We have sort of a turn meter that shows us which units still need orders before we can end our turn. We also have notifications that'll appear here after every turn. Checking these out as a new player will really help teach you the game and how you interact with it. And then finally on the left, we have a bunch of different lenses, which allow you to take a look at the map a little bit differently. For instance, here's a settler lens with a key up here, a lens that shows the different continents, and even the appeal of different tiles. You'll become more familiar with these the more you play. The next up is map options. I highly recommend you click show yield icons and show grid. I also like to put all the labels on all the geographical parts of the map, just because I think it adds to the general flavor of the game, not to mention our immersion. Next up, we have map tax, which can be a handy tool that allows you to pre-plan some of the strategy that you want to take within the game. You even have the ability to name the map tax. For instance, maybe we call this one a future city location. And there we have future city. More map features include a search. If I typed in hill and then hit the search button, it'll show me all the hills. Or if I typed in stone and hit search, it'll show me all the tiles that contain stone. Next up, the game has a strategic view. This just replaces the artistic looking map with one that some players may prefer, especially when the game and thus the map starts getting a lot more complicated. I don't use it so much, but you are able to play most of the game through this strategic view if you so desire. And then lastly, there's a full screen map mode that you may like to take a look at every once in a while as well. This sort of wraps up our introduction to the game's UI. I'm gonna try to step through the rest of this beginner's guide in the most logical way we can, but there are some features that it's just gonna have to come organically as we play the game. With that being said, let's go ahead and start on units. Units are the way that we explore and interact with the map, and they come in a few different flavors. And those are combat units and civilian units. If we check out the civil beta, we can see that combat units are broken down further. We have air combat units, land combat, naval combat, and then support units. When we select a unit, down in our bottom right, we're given the information pane for that unit and all of our options. Now, if we hold right click, we can see how far we will be able to move, not to mention that there's a white outline that'll surround each unit based on where and how much they can move. 
Remember I said there's a lot of tooltips available to you? Well, the same is true on these panes as well. If we highlight over the warrior's image, we can see that they have 100 health and it displays the abilities this unit has. For instance, warriors get a plus five to combat strength against anti-cavalry units. We also see that the warrior has a melee strength of 20 and two movement. If we bring up the tooltip for a single tile, you can see that each tile has its own movement cost. This grasslands tile has a movement cost of one. Well, we have two movement points, hence the reason we can move into this grasslands and then into this plains tile because they each have a movement cost of one. But notice that if we moved into this grasslands hill that has a movement cost of three, we wouldn't be able to go any further. I know, it's confusing, right? This says it has a movement cost of three, but we only have two movement points. And that's because it does not matter if the movement cost of the tile is greater than the unit's total movement, it will just expel all of it. But if this warrior had a three movement, it would still take three movement to move onto this Grassland Hills. Notice that this Grasslands Hills over here only has a movement cost of two. Well, what makes this tile different is the fact that it's a Grassland Hills, but it also has woods on it. We'll also see later how this will impact a unit's defense if they're in this tile, and the tooltip represents that because it says it has a defensive modifier of six, whereas the Grassland Hills without the woods has a defense modifier of only three. We can also use our left click in order to move by using the move to command. We can fortify the unit, which does what you think it does, and makes them a little bit stronger if somebody comes into attacks. Similar to fortify is the alert. Alert will put the unit into the fortified stance, but the next turn, we wouldn't get this button here that says unit needs orders for this warrior. Because the alert means it's going to wait until it sees an enemy unit before it comes back into the unit rotation. Now with that being said, you can always cancel the alert or wake the unit up manually. Also note that if a combat unit attacks a unit, it takes all of their movement points. So you always want to do your movement before you do your attacking. There are units that can attack and then move. The warrior though is not one of them. Next up is our settler here. You'll see that it has a special ability. And as you might have guessed, it can found cities. Now you will find hundreds of videos and I will talk about it at the beginning of every single Let's Play because there's definitely a lot to be said about where to settle your settler, especially on turn one. For the purposes of this guide, we're not going to go too deep into it, and it has to do with these yields represented on the map tiles. Most tiles have a certain amount of yields to them. This Grassland Woods tile also has silk on it, which is a type of resource in the game. There are bonus resources, such as the stone, and there are luxury resources. We're going to get a lot more into the luxury resources in a little bit, but the features on the tile dictate what kind of resources it gives. For instance, because it's a grasslands, it's starting with two food. As an example, this grasslands has two food. But because there's also a woods on this tile, it gives it plus one to production. And then finally, because it has silk, it gives it plus one to culture. Being able to quickly look and see what tiles have what resources is very important in civilization. Hence the reason in map options, we turned yield icons on. With all that being said, I'm not going to settle the settler here because I don't want to lose access to the woods on this tile. If I found the city here, it's even going to give us a message that says it will remove the woods on this tile. And I'll show you what that looks like. Now that Washington's been founded, notice instead of getting two food and two production, we're only getting two food and one production which is fairly standard whenever you settle your first city. But again, there's a lot more strategy into this. Before you decide on where to settle, I like to move the warrior around to see if we can get some more visibility. For instance, I'm interested to see what's down here. These tiles represent a lot of production, but it may be better for a second city rather than my first. So I'm gonna right click on this tile and move the warrior down one, and then I'm gonna right click and move them again. I could have just right clicked two tiles away and they would have moved here, but that's a habit I implore you not to get into until you're very, very comfortable. 
especially when the fog of war is still present, because you don't know what's lurking right behind the fog of war that could get your warrior into trouble. I don't see anything special here, so I do think I'm going to move the settler up one. Now, for the purposes of learning the game, I recommend, at least for your first few games, just go ahead and settle in place. Don't give it too much a thought. With all that being said, though, Civilization is definitely a butterfly effect game. What happens on turn one will impact you on turn 250, but not so much of a point that you're necessarily going to win or lose the game on a single turn. Now, remember when I said that if a combat unit attacks, it cannot move? Even the other units is true, too. If they use all their movement points, they no longer will be able to do their special abilities. Notice the settler can't settle a city. We're going to have to wait till the next turn to do it. Notice also that the AI gives you recommendations on where to settle your cities when you have your settler selected. Take a look at these and see what the AI thinks. Now, it's not perfect, but it'll definitely help you learn the game. Now, a lot of people will probably think it's unorthodox, and some people will even say it's wrong to move your settler and not settle your city on turn one. But most expert and professional players will tell you that it's okay to settle on turn two, possibly even turn three, in some very, very unique situations. Noticed our notification? Said we found a tribal village? We can click on this notification, and it'll zoom in on it. Tribal villages are nice because when we move a unit onto them, they'll give us some sort of boon. I will right-click these notifications. Notice that our turn indicator says there's no more units to move and just has us clicking next turn. Our next turn is up and our settler gets his movement points back and thus its actions. The same with our warrior. I'm going to go ahead and found the city of Washington and a lot of things happen. First, our timeline populates and says the citizens of Washington adjust to their new home and keep a wary eye on the nearby river. And we've received plus one error score because we placed the city within two tiles of a river that could flood. We're going to get a lot more into error score a little bit later, but note that you can sort of track the error by this indicator here. Right now, we have one error score out of a possible 11 in order to avoid a dark age. If we get 25 or more error score during this ancient era, we'll enter into a golden age. In between the two, in other words, if we get from 11 all the way through 24 error points, we'll enter a normal age. Now that we founded a city, we can start unpacking a lot more. For instance, notice that it now says we're gaining two and a half science per turn and 1.2 culture. Our tooltips even say what their sources are. And you might be looking at it and saying, no, Washington only has two food and one production. Au contraire, if we select Washington and go down here to our city pane, we can see that we're actually getting five production and four food. And the reason why has to do with citizens. Notice that Washington has a population of one. It also says that based on the current growth, we're going to grow in eight turns and that we have two surplus food. If we click on the Manage Citizens button, notice that each tile has a citizen button. When they're filled in, it means we have a citizen working this tile. Even though we only have a population of one, you can see that we have two filled in, and that's because you always work your city tile. Now it's starting to make a little bit more sense. You can see that we have two food from this tile and two food from this tile, which gives us our four food that this city is currently earning. But hold on, Echo. That makes sense because it has four food, but it also says that Washington has five production. Well, if we highlight over these icons, we can see where we're getting the additional production. We're getting three from work tiles, that adds up, two from this stone tile, and one from the grassland tile that the city is on, but it also says we're getting two from the palace, to give us our total of five. If we click on this button here, it'll toggle some city details. If we click over on the Districts, Buildings, Wonders, and Trading Post button, the little icon represented by the city, you can see that our palace itself has some built-in abilities. The palace is the building that comes with your city center when you found your civilization. And now it starts to add up a little bit more. Our palace by itself is giving us two production, five gold, two culture, one housing, and two amenities. 
Amenities are the, all those things that our citizens are asking for, and it makes them happy. You'll notice that Washington currently has plus one amenity, which is making it content. If you have too few amenities for the population that you have, your citizens will be displeased. Likewise, if you have more amenities than you need, your citizens will be happy, and these can adjust what your total yields are. Well, Echo, the palace explains why we're getting all of our yields, but notice it only says plus two science, yet our overall civilization says we're getting 2.5. Once again, we can highlight over the science coming out of Washington, and notice that it's getting 0.5 from population, because you naturally get science based on the size of your empire. The same thing from culture. Notice that we're getting 1 from the palace and 0.2 from the population. In the Manage Citizen screen, if I select this cotton tile, notice that we're now getting the same two food, but we're receiving much more gold at the expense of losing production. And you can see these yields change based on what tiles I'm working. You don't have to manually assign the citizens. The AI will do it for you in each city. Now, when Washington grows in eight turns, we'll start working another tile. In some instances, it may be advantageous to direct the AI and say, you know what, I want to work as much production as I can. Well, you can do that just by clicking in the button. We can also say, ignore production. I don't care about it. Do something else. By doing that, notice the AI started working the cotton tile. We can also have it do multiple things. For instance, concentrate on food and ignore production, or concentrate on culture and food, ignoring production and ignoring science. For the most part, especially in your earlier games, you can leave all these unselected and just let the AI manage it for you. A quick strategy note about cities and your settlers. Notice that our borders around Washington only extend in what we call the first ring. And the reason why this is important is because the only tiles that you have available to work are within your first ring. Well, if I click on purchase tile, you can see that it goes out another entire ring. In fact, your cities can work up to three rings out or from the center of your city, three tiles away. But it takes a long time for your city to grow its culture and thus its borders for you to gain access to these tiles. That's the reason why I chose to move Washington up. Let's see what it would have looked like had I settled on this tile. We still get the error score bonus for settling a city within two tiles of a tile that could flood, which by the way is these floodplain tiles here. But now notice that Washington lost a production here because we removed the woods like we talked about before. Which means when our city does grow, we won't have access to another two production tile. Additionally, we don't have immediate access to this cotton. It's going to take the city's borders growing for us to be able to work it. Alternatively though, we would be one tile closer to the silk and thus a valuable culture tile. There's no necessarily wrong answer, just based on your preference and the strategy that you're starting to build in your head. Additionally, there is a counter argument, because in this instance, in our first ring, we have a mountain, which is not workable. And this stone is now three tiles away, just like this luxury is. So I definitely think an argument could have been made for an alternate city location. With our city settled, our turn meter thingamajob will also notify us when we have other things to do. For instance, right now it's telling us we need to choose research. Are you still with me? Because we're about to get deeper. We're going to click the choose research button. A simple menu will come up where you have the ability to select any of these researches. I will traditionally go right into the technology tree for a couple of reasons. First, because when you're looking at it this way, you can see what technology you're going to be unlocking when you finish it. For instance, by researching pottery, it'll make irrigation and writing available. By researching animal husbandry, it'll make archery available next. Whereas this screen doesn't really say that. Notice in our technology tree, we have a search feature. For instance, if I search up infantry, it gives us all of the technologies that have something to do with infantry. Replaceable parts unlocks the infantry unit, as we can see right here. It also gives us satellites because it unlocks mechanized infantry and military science. 
because it unlocks line infantry. We can also use the filter function if we're very concerned about some things, let's say we really want to concentrate on food in our civilization, and now it highlights everything that has to do with food. Scientific theory here will give us plus one food from the plantation improvement. Archery is highlighted because it unlocks the ability to build the Wonder Temple of Artemis, which comes with plus four food. And then there's also this key button that could be helpful to you because each of these icons represents something different. Notice the star here means it's a special unlock. By unlocking pottery, it allows us to harvest bonus resources improved by farms. By unlocking animal husbandry, it allows harvesting of cattle, sheep, and deer. Unlocking irrigation allows clearing of marsh and harvesting of bananas. And all the way up the tech tree, there will usually be some sort of special unlock. Some of them may not be of particular interest to your civilization, but they always have a strategic implication. By researching mathematics, we get plus one movement for all of our naval units. It's important to note because you're not the only player going through the technology tree. All the enemy AIs are as well. Now, the five highlighted techs are the ones that we can research right now. But if I clicked masonry, for example, it'll put us on the line to researching mining and then into masonry. We can also queue technologies up by holding the shift key and then clicking. And now we're gonna research mining, then masonry, then pottery, then writing. Now, what technology you're gonna research is gonna be heavily dependent on the strategy you are choosing to employ, which is mostly gonna be dictated by your civilization, its leader, and the map that is sitting in front of you. Try not to lock yourself in to one particular strategy before you even see the map or before the game even starts to unfold. Now, in this case, I really like this stone tile, but in order to improve this tile, it's gonna require mining. In order to improve the cotton, it's gonna require irrigation. And these improvements are things like mines, quarries, or plantations. Both the mine and the quarry will give us plus one production on that tile. Incidentally, it'll also give us minus one appeal. Also notice that further down in the tooltip says that the mine starts with the plus one production, but then when we get apprenticeship, it gets another production. Industrialization is another production. And smart materials is even another one. So a mine improvement could give you a bonus total of five production. Starting off though, it's only gonna give you the one. So I think mining is the way to go. Now notice we've started progressing through the culture tree as well, based on the fact that we're now getting 1.2 culture per turn. And when we click on the code of laws, it gives us the same sort of menu that we saw with the tech tree. We can also open the civics tree here. In your civics tree, everybody starts off with code of laws. To try to explain what the civics tree is, it's sort of the cultural and civic advancements that your civilization is going to make. All of these symbols are different policy cards. We'll get into those here in a few minutes as well. But there's also different buildings that you will unlock in the civics tree as well. Sometimes they're wonders, sometimes they're buildings for certain districts. We also unlock different government types, such as monarchy or democracy. Lastly, on the subjects of the technology tree and the civics tree, Notice that it says mining is going to take 10 turns. The reason why it's going to take 10 turns is because mining requires 25 total science. And remember, we're making two and a half science per turn. Well, two and a half science per turn divided by 25 science means mining is going to take 10 turns. If we improved our science to say five science per turn, well, mining would only take us five turns. Lastly, while not immediately evident on pottery, animal husbandry, or mining, notice that all the techs have something called a boost. And what this will do will half the amount of turns required. Well, not quite half, more like a 40% boost. And that's evident by this little symbol here. So for instance, if we founded a city on the coast, we would be able to research sailing a lot quicker. And that's one strategy for getting through the technology tree. By being able to unlock what we call Eureka moments, it allows us to boost the technologies. If we own two galleys, we would boost shipbuilding. The same goes in the civic tree, except we call them inspirations instead of Eurekas. If we improve three tiles, we will boost craftsmanship. This can really help you catch up to the AI or blast right past them if you're concentrating on what these boosts are. 
Sometimes you're not going to be able to accomplish them, but others, you're going to specifically target them in order to unlock civics and technologies that much quicker. Yes, the AI has the option to do the same, but they may not be as efficient as you are at it. Next up is production. Back down here in our turn jobby, it says it's time to choose a production. And that's because every city is able to produce one thing at a time. So when we click on choose production, it gives us a list of everything we have available to produce. This list is gonna grow and change based on the technologies and the civics you've researched. Right now, we have access to slingers, which are ranged class combat units, warriors, scouts, which are recon units that have faster movement than warriors, but weaker melee strength. Next, we have builders. Builders are the civilian unit responsible for things like building the improvements on the mine, or building farms, or chopping down these woods. We also have buildings available to us. Now, in this case, there's a building available in our city center. The city center is a district within Washington. It's this tile here. If we build the monument, we would literally see a little monument appear within the city center. We're eventually going to unlock other districts. The first districts you will be able to unlock are going to be the holy site if we unlock astrology or the campus district if we unlock writing. If we go check out our Civilopedia and click on campus, we can see that there are buildings able to be built in the campus. We'll get into more of this later, but know that if we had a campus down here, it would show the buildings beneath the campus that we we're able to build. In most cases, I like to go with a scout or another combat unit first so that we can further explore the map. Also note that you can queue up units or buildings to be built. For instance, if I click on monument, it'll add the monument to the queue. So after the scout's done being produced, it'll go right into the monument. I am not going to do that because by the time this scout is done being produced in six turns, we may have different information around the map that'll change our strategy. And that could cause us to want to change what's being produced. So for the time being, I leave the queue empty. In our options, under the interface tab, there's the always open production queue. I have it enabled, but it comes default disabled. So if we look up here, we can see the regular production queue, and this is how it would look by default. Notice it also has a purchase button and it'll show us everything that we were able to purchase right out without using our production using gold. Unfortunately, right now we only have 10 gold, so we can't afford any of this. The same goes with faith. If we start earning faith resource, we may be able to purchase some units using faith. And then there's the multi queue button, which allows you to queue things across your entire civilization in one handy screen. Now, just like we learned that it was going to take 10 turns to research mining based on our science. This scout is going to take six turns based on the production being provided in Washington. Also note that the production in this city is not civilization wide. It's only in Washington. And if we highlight over the scout, we can see that it costs 30 production total. Well, we're working five production per turn. Hence the reason it's going to take six turns. With all that being done, it says there's a unit ready to move. We click the button, it highlights over the warrior. Note I needed to click that button manually. There's another option I want you to be aware of that's also under the interface tab called Auto Unit Cycling. I have it disabled. I do that for video recording purposes. I don't want the camera to move around all by itself going from unit to unit because it may ruin a certain cut that I was trying to take when I'm sitting here running my mouth. Now, I really want to go get this tribal village, but I know we have six turns until this scout is done. So I think I'm going to keep going and exploring in this direction to see if we can find any other tribal villages or perhaps meet some neighbors. Looks like we found a citrus luxury resource, and it happens to be pretty close to the silk resource. In addition to the fact that there's fresh water here in the form of the Great Salt Lake, I think this is going to be an excellent area for another city. So to remind myself of that, I'm going to put a city tack right here. And this will remind me when I do finally produce another settler that, hey, I'm interested in settling right here. Why is the fresh water important? Well, that goes on to our next lesson. Here in Washington, notice that it says we have one out of six housing. If we go into our city details, 
and scroll all the way to the bottom of the Citizens, Amenities, and Housing tab, we see our housing information. And we're gaining one from buildings. Well, we know the only building we have is the palace. And then five from water. And that's because we founded the city of Washington on a river. And what this means is this city can support a population of up to six. But when we even get to a population of five, in other words, one less than the amount of houses we have in the city, we'll actually start slowing down our growth. I'll show you more on that later, but I did want to highlight it considering we just talked about fresh water. This is also an excellent opportunity to talk about growth. At the top of our citizen amenities and housing tab, notice it says we have a two food surplus. It starts off by looking at our food per turn, which we know is four, two from our city center tile and two from the tile that we're working, which is this stone. But our food consumption is two. And that's because we have a population of one and every population requires two food. Well, we need 15 food to grow to our next population and we're getting a surplus of two food because the other two food is being eaten. Hence the reason why it's going to take eight turns before we grow. Because on the seventh turn, we'll have 14 surplus food. And then finally, on the eighth turn, we'll pass over the 15 food requirement and we'll be able to see that meter grow here. I originally recorded this absolute beginner's guide with the intentions of releasing it as just one video. But after a quick poll, the people have spoken, and it seems the majority of you prefer a few smaller videos instead. So I think this is a good spot to end this first video. I hope you're looking forward to the second. I'm also looking forward to seeing what you have to say in the comments below. So until next time, much love, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.